Great to see you, Calvary. Uh, Pastor Chad, and, and I get to share with you for the last weekend of online only services at Calvary. Um, starting next weekend at our regular service times, our Sweetwater campus will be open for in-person live worship. And we're looking forward to uh, seeing you and getting the chance to share with you uh, the, the, the act of worshiping God together, of celebrating Jesus together. And for those of you that aren't comfortable yet uh, joining us for in-person worship, we're going to be continuing our online campus. So for uh, these last couple of months, it's been online only. Beginning next weekend, you'll have the option of in-person or online or on demand after uh, Sunday at noon. So uh, it's a new day and it's a new step. And we're taking that step carefully, intentionally and prayerfully. I hope you'll be able to join us, whether it's in person or online next weekend as well. So uh, I'm going to invite you to take your Bible or your Bible app and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 8. We're looking at this great story today, but while you're finding that and getting ready, can you believe that we have just concluded 60 days of extreme social distancing uh, as a nation, as a state, and quarantine? Uh, it's been 75 days since we last gathered for live worship by the time we start worshiping next Saturday. And that seems almost impossible. And, and it's been a challenge for an extreme extrovert like me. Uh, I, I mean, I love people. I wanna be with people. I wanna talk with people. I wanna eat with people. I just wanna be around people. And for the last 60 plus days, I've been told to stay away from people. And, and at times I felt like I was gonna go crazy. And I don't know if any of you have felt like you're gonna go crazy during this quarantine social distancing season, but if so, uh, I get it, I get it. And in fact, probably all of us have either done something crazy or seen something crazy in these last couple of months. And uh, in fact, after the message, I challenge you to, to share the craziest thing you've seen or you've done personally uh, during this time. Uh, I, I did ask our, our staff that were in the office, uh, what are the crazy things they've either done or seen? And there's some of their responses. Uh, they thought it was crazy seeing people in public in full hazmat suits. Can't disagree. Uh, it's crazy to get up at 5 a.m. Uh, to go to the grocery store and wait in line to buy toilet paper. And I know it's crazy because I did it once. Okay. Uh, it, it's crazy to see people driving in their cars all alone wearing a face mask because you're all alone in your car. Anyway, you can figure it out. One, one of the things that's crazy is that emergency rooms and hospitals were empty, but Home Depot and Lowe's were like Black Friday busy. That's crazy. Or uh, how about this? Ordering dinner and having it being brought to you and getting a side of toilet paper with it. That's a little bit nuts. Or how about this one? Getting rebuked for walking the wrong way down an aisle in a grocery store. Never thought that would happen. So uh, we may have seen or done some crazy things these past few weeks, but today we're looking at an impossible story that deals with a true crazy and dangerous situation. Luke chapter eight, beginning in verse 26, it's a story of Jesus dealing with a man who is demon possessed. Uh, follow along with me as I read. It says, then they, Jesus and the disciples, sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him and he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And the demons begged Jesus not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these pigs. So Jesus gave them permission and then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. 
Then people went out to see what had happened and they came to Jesus and they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon possessed man had been healed. And then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to depart from them for they were seized with great fear. So Jesus got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged Jesus that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And so he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Wow, this is an amazing story of impossible life change. And, and if your life is kind of in that place where you feel like you need some transformation, you, you need a life change, you need a reset, or maybe you need rescuing, then you can learn from this encounter with Jesus. The first thing we see in this uh, story is that the man's life was completely out of control. His life was completely out of control. Think about the description that we just read. He was homeless, he was naked, he was dangerous to other people, he was self-destructive to himself, and ultimately he was possessed by demons. Now, I don't know about you, but in my life, I've encountered a lot of crazy people, scary people, dangerous people. And the question that often comes uh, to mind is why? Why are they like this? You know, are they an addict? Are they mentally impaired? Are they psychologically unstable? Are they mentally ill? Are they even possessed? You see, this story is about Jesus healing a man from demons, which a lot of you right now are probably going, all right, pastor, is that real? Is there really such a thing as demon possession? Are demons even real? Uh, because a lot of people in our, you know, kind of educated modern culture dismiss the idea of demons and the reality of demons uh, outright. Uh, you know, they want to say, hey, that wasn't really demons. The man was really just mentally ill and he had some kind of diagnosed condition uh, and, and we treat it completely different today. In fact, I, I just want you to know, I was raised in that kind of faith culture that said, yes, Jesus healed this man, but he really didn't have demons. Problem is they told me to read the Bible. And when I read the Bible, I came up with a, a question that they couldn't answer. What happened to the pigs? I mean, what happened to the pigs? I mean, if the man was just uh, crazy and he wasn't demon possessed, then why did a herd of pigs rush down a steep hill into the lake and drown? Something happened to the pigs. Uh, and it was the demons coming out of the man. See, if you read the Bible, and we actually encourage you to do that here at Calvary because we believe the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God, that tells us what to believe and how to live. And the Bible is really clear that we're in a battle uh, between the forces of God and the forces of evil. And, and Satan or Lucifer or the devil, whichever name you prefer, was an angel who led a rebellion against God. And of course he lost and he was thrown out of heaven. He was condemned to hell. In fact, hell exists for Satan. If you read the scene of judgment in Revelation chapter 20, it says uh, people are cast into the lake of fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. And so demons are these spiritual evil beings that are aligned against God and his people. Their mission is to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus told us that in the Gospel of John where he said the thief, talking about Satan, comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And uh, by the way, and this just makes sense, if you believe in angels, then you have to believe in demons. It's, it's pretty much a must. So um, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe that Jesus actually is the Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe that he was raised from the dead and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, um, I want you to understand that you have zero reason to be afraid of these demonic forces in our world. You have no reason to fear. Uh, don't hear us talking about demons and think, oh, I've got to be terrified. No, you don't. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, listen to the Apostle John, who happened to be there that day in that place where the, that thousands of demons came out of that man. He says... 
Little children, you are from God and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he that is in the world. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. What does that mean? It means this, when you confess Jesus as Lord of your life, God the Holy Spirit moved into your life. He literally took up residence in you. He is there. He's the voice of of wisdom. He's the voice that teaches. He's the voice of conviction. He's the voice of comfort. But he's also the guardian of your soul. See, he's greater than all those forces of evil that are out there. So no evil spirit can touch you. You're untouchable to them. How can they affect you though? Through deceit and through fear through deceit and fear. Fear and lies are the weapons that demons use against the children of God. If you're afraid, you're not gonna follow when Jesus says, follow me. When you're deceived, you're not gonna know the right direction to go or or the right path to take in following Jesus because you're gonna be believing the lies of the enemy. So some of you are going, okay, if demons are real and if that's the case, then what about possession? How can somebody get demon possessed? Well, this is how I understand it and see if this doesn't make sense. Uh, Right now, uh, who are you following? I mean, who are you following? Now, most of you that are watching this should be able to answer Jesus. We're a follower of Jesus. He's our savior, he's our Lord, we're following him. Okay, so Jesus is gonna lead us to life and to love and to peace and to joy. Okay, he wants to fill our lives with that. And the more that you surrender to Jesus, guess what you get more of in your life? Life and love and peace and joy. And and so you want to keep giving control of your life over to the Holy Spirit, who's going to lead you to uh, all those wonderful blessings that God has for us. And the ultimate goal, if you're a follower of Jesus, is for Jesus to control your life. Now, if you're not following Jesus, who are you following? The answer is Satan. You might be going, oh, no, no, I'm, I'm on my own. I'm doing my own thing. I'm not following Satan. Okay, you're not intentionally following him, but you're believing the lies. You're living in the fear. Uh, he's influencing you, and he came to steal and kill and destroy. Now, there are some people who enthusiastically embrace the path of evil. They, they just go ahead and embrace all of it. Uh, and, and here's the thing, just as the more you surrender to Jesus, the more life and love and peace and joy are in your life, the more you surrender to evil, it's going to increase the destruction in your life and caused by your life. It's going to increase pain and death, hatred and anger and lust and greed and abuse are going to define your life because the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And your life, if you surrender to evil, is going to reflect the values of Satan in the same way that if you surrender to Jesus, your life is going to reflect the character of Christ. And what happens is uh, eventually, if you keep surrendering to evil, Satan's going to control your life. That's what possession looks like. Now, uh, a lot of times, this just makes sense to me, we ask for reasons for acts of evil. You know, how could somebody be a mass murderer? How could they go in and shoot up a bunch of people? How could they be a serial killer? How could they be a child molester or a terrorist? How could they do these these horrible acts of evil? Well, um, a lot of times people in our culture look for a political affiliation to blame or religious influences or mental illness or broken families. And I think all of those are factors. But personally, I also believe that that kind of destruction can be connected to demon possession. Because if you're that full of hatred and anger and destruction, then you've surrendered to the thief who came only to steal and kill and destroy. Uh, It makes sense to me. Maybe it makes sense to you. But uh, this man's life was completely and totally out of control He was broken, he was hopeless, he was alone, he was destructive, he was powerless to change until he had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. That's really the impossible miracle in the story is that this man who was completely out of control had a life-changing encounter with Jesus. I mean, think about it. At the beginning of the story, he's crazy, he's naked, he's wild. He meets Jesus and suddenly he's clothed, he's sane, and he's in control. 
It does not get much more dramatic in life change than that. And, and I hope in the story that you can see Jesus' power. I mean, it's on full display. This man is possessed by demons, thousands of demons. By the way, he says his name is Legion, for there are many. A Roman legion had between 4,000 and 6,000 men in it. So here's Jesus facing 5,000 demons, and he wins easily in a cakewalk. I mean, that's power. I mean, think about it. We're in a spiritual battle. We already established that. But the outcome of this battle is not in question. Jesus is king. He has all authority. Even his enemies beg for mercy. You did catch that in the story, right? The demons were begging for mercy. You know what that means for us? That means if you're a follower of Jesus, you can live without fear. Because we know the enemy is real. We know he's attacking us, but we do not fear. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Spirit of God, who has the same power, uh, is living in you. You don't have to be afraid of any evil forces. You know, we just keep surrendering to Jesus, surrendering to the Holy Spirit, and, and the enemy is powerless to stop us. Now, we can stop ourselves by believing the enemy's lies and living in fear. Because that's going to stop us from following Jesus. But Satan can't stop you from following Jesus. Satan can't touch you as a follower of Jesus. As long as you keep surrendering to Jesus, you're going to have that freedom and that power in Christ. So I want you to see Jesus' power. I want you to know Jesus' power. I want you to live the power of God daily. And I want you to see in this story that God redeems. He has the power to redeem and he does that. No matter where you've been, what you've done, or what's been done to you, God can redeem your life. He can restore your life. He can heal your life. He can change your life. Uh, now, you may find that difficult to believe, but I'm going to invite you to surrender to Jesus. Just ask him to save you. Ask him to change you. Ask him to heal you, to restore you. And I, I promise you, God will redeem your life. And he'll do it in unexpected ways. He'll do it in ways that shock the people around you. He'll do it in ways that... Did you catch the story? That will change your mind, alter your behaviors, and surprise the people who know you. So what happened to this man. They came out and found him clothed and in his right mind, and he's no longer insane. He's no longer destructive to others or to himself. That's a changed life. That's God redeeming his life. Now, I want to I talk just for a minute because I love the phrase, he was in his right mind. Because he'd been out of his mind. He'd been crazy. He'd been scary. But he's in his right mind. And, and, and I want to rant about this just for a moment, if you will. Because I think a lot of times we get the wrong idea about what it is to have a right mind. Now, everyone watching this has an opinion about pretty much everything. You have an opinion about what restaurants to go to, where to shop, what clothes look good. You have an opinion about health. You have an opinion about politics. You have an opinion about everything. And, and again, I grew up in, in the kind of uh, churches that taught the Bible and emphasized on having correct theology. You got to believe the right things. And if you believe the right things, then uh, you, you kind of lived your life arrogantly believing that you were right and everybody else was wrong. And, uh, and then you treated people accordingly. You treated people rudely, didn't respect them, you weren't kind, uh, you just were a jerk because you were right and you justified it by being right. And the thing is, we don't just do that with religion, do we? I mean, we do that with politics. We believe we're right and everybody else is wrong that doesn't agree with us and we denigrate them and attack them and dismiss them. We do that right now with uh, the coronavirus and how we respond to that. See, some of you are watching this and you have no intentions of being here live next week. You think it's foolish, you think it's dangerous, and, and really, you might even be questioning our sanity and the fact that we're willing to, you, you kind of think we're willing to hurt people and put them at risk. There's others of you that cannot wait for us to open our facility live because you want to be here and you think everybody who's not going to be here is somehow faithless and a coward. There are those of you that every time you leave your house, you wear a face mask. And you think anybody who doesn't wear a face mask is, is risky and putting other people at risk. There are some of you that are watching this that 
refuse to wear a face mask because you just believe that it's completely unnecessary and this whole thing's overblown and you're not gonna do that. Here's the thing, it doesn't matter what you believe, what matters is how you treat other people. See, you might think you're right, you might actually be correct in your thinking, but if you treat other people wrong, you're wrong. Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have correct theology, no. If you have correct politics, no. If you have the right convictions, no. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And love is patient, and love is kind, and love is not rude, and love does not demand its own way. So if you've got the right theology and the right convictions, but you don't love people, you're wrong. Because God calls us to love others and love him, period. Uh, so here's, here's my conviction, right mind. You know what a right mind is? It's a mind that is surrendered to God's will and to God's wisdom. And God's will is for us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. That's the kind of life change right now that's gonna change our world. Not winning arguments on social media, not denigrating people who are different from you in their viewpoints about how to address the pandemic or theology or anything else, but our willingness to love is gonna carry the day. So this man's life was completely and totally out of control until he had that life-changing encounter with Jesus. If you're watching this and you've never had that life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ, right now we're gonna invite you to surrender your life to Jesus. Just declare him Lord and Savior, acknowledge you need him to save you, and I'm gonna invite you to click on the button that just showed up on your screen that you're watching on. You know, if you've got the chat feature going on, just click on that, one of our live hosts will uh, talk with you, pray with you, encourage you, and we would love to get your information. If, if this is a decision that you wanna to make to follow Jesus, we'd love to get your information so that we can follow up this week with you. So uh, this man's life was completely out of control, but God redeemed his life, changed his life. And, and then the story concludes with rejection and mission. There's a surprise ending to the story, actually two of them, if you will. The first one is that the people gathered who saw this impossible miracle, the people asked Jesus to leave. They want him out of there. They thought Jesus was more dangerous than the crazy demon guy. And I get it, I mean, Jesus cost some money, that whole herd of pigs rushed into the lake and died, and they looked at Jesus as an economic threat, and they said, hey, can you leave? We can't, we can't afford to have you in our midst. Um, you know what the reality is? Jesus always makes people in situations uncomfortable. Always. Jesus really isn't nice or pleasant. In fact, he would make a terrible dinner guest. Just terrible. I want to be at his dinner, but uh, he'd, it'd be difficult hosting him because Jesus is always religiously controversial. Jesus is always socially disruptive and he's always going to bring conviction wherever he goes. <laughs> That's reality. Jesus is a living, breathing confrontation to our comfort, our selfishness, our pride, and our self-righteousness. Uh, and lots of people are uncomfortable with the biblical Jesus. I mean, lots of people out in the world like to refer to Jesus, but he's a false Jesus. He's a, a narrative that just blesses everything and everyone. That's not who Jesus is. The biblical Jesus makes people uncomfortable, and lots of people are uncomfortable not only with Jesus, but with Jesus' people. You just need to know that. So they asked Jesus to leave, that's a surprise. And then Jesus gave the man a mission. Did you catch that? The man asked Jesus, can I come with you? Can I follow you? And Jesus said, no. That's a surprise in the story. It's just, no, you can't come with me. Now there's a reason Jesus told him no, because the man wasn't a Jew. Jesus was going back to the Jews. And if the man had been with him, uh, it wouldn't have worked, it had been a distraction. I mean, he was a non-Jew living in a country that was not kosher. Uh, he didn't follow the Jewish customs. He would have stood out like a sore thumb. So instead of taking him with him, Jesus sent him on a mission. Go to your city and declare how much God has done for you. That was his mission, that's our mission. And honestly, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's your mission. 
to go to your people, to go to your community, to go to your family and tell them how much God has done for you. Why? Because they know you. They trust you. They can see the life change. They can see the new attitude. They can see the different way that you treat people. Imagine this guy that everybody knew as the demon-possessed crazy man showing back up, saying in his right mind and telling people how Jesus changed his life. That's powerful. And you have that kind of power. Your life change lived out in front of your friends and family is more powerful than any sermon I could ever preach. God has given you that mission He's given you that ability to share. Will you go and share your life with them? Because Jesus is sending you today. He's sending you. Now, now see, eventually you're going to get to be with Jesus for all eternity. But today, will you declare how Jesus has changed your life? If your answer is yes, I'm going to challenge you to do one of two things. Either just post something on social media about how Jesus has changed your life. Now, if you've been a troll and you've been a jerk and you've been angry, you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to work on your life first and then before you declare. But if, if you've been living it, tell people how Jesus has changed your life. What we'd love for you to do as pastors is send us an email just kind of telling us how Jesus has changed your life so we can read those and rejoice with you. But today, will you declare how Jesus has changed your life? Because that's what a person who's been changed by Jesus does. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for loving us, for giving us life in your son, for speaking life into us, for calling us uh, to follow you into love and peace and joy. Give us the power to reject the temptation, to see through the lies, to uh, just to, to live without fear so that we can follow you and honor you and so that we can tell people what amazing things you have done in our lives. We love you. We commit ourselves to following you in Jesus' name. Amen.